Hey guys, welcome back. Adam Flowers here today. It is December 7th, 2022, and uh, Redwood Met and I are here to talk about the Young Turks. Chicago Outfit History, guys, welcome back. It's Mob Vlog. Redwood Met, how are you doing today? On Pearl Harbor Day, I'm doing good. It's Pearl Harbor Day. That's right. What happened 81 years ago? 81 years ago. Yeah. You remember that, don't you, Red? I wasn't alive. <laughs> I was oh, born in well, Red, Red wasn't alive. Yeah. Okay. You don't remember that at all. My buddy Jack I remember remembers my, that. My folks talking about it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that's, uh, yeah. Anyway, I'd like to go there one day and see it. Uh, go to Oahu. It's beautiful, it man. Out. It's beautiful. I'm sure the island is. I'd well, like to even the, even the uh, the tour, the park there. Yeah, it's beautiful. It really is. Awesome. Yeah, one day. So today we're going to talk about the Young Turks and our Ryer Dides are here. This is December, man. This is a tough month on YouTube. It slows down, but I see that uh, everybody's here today. I mean, Don Chichio, Tommy Bridges. Haven't seen you in a second. Greg Polly, Homer Byron. Uh, Chris Edmondson, John Apollo Apollo, all the way from Greece, Mark N, Jim Magnifici, Leanne's rolling along, uh, Paul Spagnola, Catherine Guerrero. Sorry, I pocket dialed you the other day. I pocket dialed her while I was at my mom's. Did I tell you that, Red? <laughs> I was, I'm standing there with my mom talking, and suddenly I hear some voice, Adam, Adam, where the hell is that coming from? I looked down at my hand. <laughs> I had somehow touched my phone and I called her. Anyway, Tommy Bridges, Chain Weaver, Joe Collada. Good to see you. Um, Joe used to go golfing. Don Berlin. It's good to see you. Johnny, uh, Tony Johnson, Jim Magnifici, Frank Ferrero. Famous. Every I've never heard of him. Famous. Dustin McGill, Holman Sanders. Everybody's here. Julie M., uh, John Wallace. Anyways, thanks for tuning in today, guys. We're going to get to the bottom of uh, a big question. Sonny Zaro, it is it is good to see you today. And um, well, welcome, everybody. So, yeah, the Young Turks. I just I'm called going the suicide down. line. They put him on hold. I don't. Is that what he said? He, put the, he called the suicide line. They put him on hold. Yeah. He's a joke. They put him on hold. Tony, Tony Bug, Gary Fisher. Hey, guys, we're going to be talking about the Chicago <clears throat> outfit, the Young Turks. There's a lot of, well, who were the Young Turks? And there's, if you even, you Google Young Turks Chicago, you get some weird association that currently exists uh, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about today. But what we are talking about, um, I put a, a link down in the description, if you guys want to follow along, open up the link. You're, you Maybe you're interested and you want to read the entire article. Uh, it's pretty damned interesting. And it's about how the Chicago outfit originally uh, formed and uh, how people like Al Capone, Tony Accardo, uh, Humphreys, Camel, what was At his name? At that time, they were all young Turks. They were coming up. Right, Paul, the waiter, Rika, all these guys. They call them curly. Did you know that that uh, that Humphreys had so many aliases like John Brunswick, G. Logan, <laughs> Mr. Lincoln, Dave Ostrand, Cy Pope, and John Hall? That's more than the two dozen that are listed by the FBI. The press referred to him as the camel, the hump, but his nickname was bestowed on him by people who actually knew him that spoke volumes, like Mr. Einstein, the Brainy Hood, and Mr. Moneybags. That's what his friends called him, not the FBI or the press or the no. aliens. 
Um, but the guy, he had a uh, he had didactic reasoning, is what it said. Red and I sat here and looked this stuff up. Look, the guy was a double talker. He would say things like, yeah. you know, all dogs have four legs. Um, all all uh, four legged uh, animals, or all animals have four legs. Therefore, all animals are dogs. Is a double talker. It's this, it's, but but it, but it made sense. It was it was the very teach. logical, articulate man. Yes, double talker that had reasoning. So, anyway, that's what we're going to be bringing up today. People like that, and we're going to go through this article. So the link is down in the description if you guys want to follow along. Let's look at some of the comments here. That red is uh, is Turk short for something. Turk, 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 Turk isn't it Turk, Turk, Arillo or Turk, red. Uh, a Turk, I think it was because of the Turkish war. Young Turks, they were coming up. I think that's where it came from. I don't know for sure. Is Turk short for something? I have no idea, Sean Pender. That's a good question. You know, they had Turk Torello, so. Get the papers. Get the papers. I got to go get the papers. Yeah. papers. Two times. There it is. <laughs> you got it, Sean. Oh, geez. Uh, Big Tuna, good to see you guys. Welcome into the room. Hit the like button, guys, if you're uh, – uh, hit the like button. Why are you always coming into Chicago when this comes on, Leanne? Well, the reason is because it it's just a thing. We do it to specifically for you. Honest to God, we do, Leanne. <laughs> Red, are you with me? That's funny. Oh, I'm with you. I'm All with right. you. Maybe it wasn't. Or the guy, Turk Torillo. That's what I was yeah, – thanks, Don. That's what I was thinking of, Turk Torillo. The young Turks had nothing to do with Turk Torillo, though. Correct, Red? No. Correct. So no. I have no idea what the young Turks actually stood for. Um, yeah, it's fate. It is. It really is. It's it's the reason all – It was all the up-and-comers. It was the up-and-comers, the pups that were coming up. They were Turks. They were strong. They were mighty. Turks. I don't know what the hell that even means, man. Honest to God, it's a it's a good question though. It's it really a euphemism. Is. It's a euphemism. It's a euphemism. Like okay. like uh, they use Brahma for uh, Frank Collada. Maybe maybe cool. we'll find this out. Maybe we'll find this out. I'll tell you what, I'm going to do. I'm going to share this. So if you guys want to see the uh, the screen while I'm going through this, you can. Uh, and let's do a tab, Chrome tab. Uh, Young Turks. Okay, share. There we go. All right, Red. So there are, uh, this is the article. And while in prison in Philadelphia in 1930, Big Al Capone underwent the kind of self-reflection that is inescapable byproduct, an inescapable byproduct of an incarceration. For Capone, it resulted in a grand scheme. He bequeathed to his successors, bequeathed to his successors. Later in Chicago, in anticipation of his 1931 tax conviction, Capone held at least one syndicate meeting before what he assumed would be a brief incarceration. Summoning his most loyal and indispensable soldiers to his side, Snorky presented his vision, a national crime corporation that would be run not by an all-powerful boss, but by a board of directors, a corporation of thieves partnering with the Torio Lansky Commission, whose goal was to make a swift transition into a more legitimate white collared scheming. Until now, this world had been dominated by the upper world robber barons and Wall Street swindlers, whom the nation held to an in infinitely lower standard of injustice of, ju of justice than the rest of the population. By encouraging his heirs to follow that path, Al Capone was orchestrating his legacy. So he's putting together basically a corporation. He's saying, let's put together a board of directors that's going to oversee this whole country and work together as a team. This guy had visions, man, for, I mean, being a criminal and being a, oh, yeah. a go bad guy, the guy had motivation and he had, had no education. He didn't, have a, he didn't have an eighth grade education. You don't need education to be successful. Elon Musk's a college dropout. So, you know, this guy had no education, yet he had motivation, perseverance. He had a, a the ability to look ahead to the future. He had vision. 
He was a man of vision. Exactly. He had vision. So Al Capone, the new regime heeded the mistakes of the old and adopted a modus operandi that would serve them effectively well into the future. Capone's heirs apparent grasped the obvious. Al's downfall was largely due to his refusal to hide his money or to provide an explanation of what he did for a living. So you can't stand there and flash your money around and, you know what I mean, right? Drive fancy cars and have a Bentley and live in a mansion and, and go, oh, I'm not going to tell you what I do for a living. Can't do that. Well, it was the days when income tax was had just been passed, like what, 19, 19 just before uh, World War One. So really, people weren't used to income tax. They thought they could get away with it. Okay. Capone's personal style only increased his vulnerability. Combined with his pension for violent retaliation and a high-profile, fancy clothes, flashy cars, and movie star hanger-ons, Capone was his own worst enemy. His heirs would contrast Capone's style with one of their own, anonymity. No effort would be spared to avoid press coverage of the new bosses. Al Capone took every opportunity to point out the judicial double standards in rationalizing his crime wave. Although unschooled, Capone learned on the streets what respected academics such as Ferdinand, Ferdinand Lundberg acquired in research libraries. In his seminal 1968 book, The Rich and the Super Rich, Lundberg describes how the fortunes and social standings of Carnegie, Whitney, Rockefeller, McCormick, and others were built on a foundation of white-collar thuggery, or as Capone called it, legitimate rackets. See? <laughs> legitimate rackets. Robert Baron Cornelius Vanderbilt hardly recoiled at the accusation, asking, quote, you don't suppose you can run a railroad in accordance with the statues, do you? No. Among the crimes Lundberg attended, uh, sorry, attributed to the country club were uh, set were embezzlement, big fraud, restraint of trade, misrepresentation in advertising, and the sale of securities, infringement of patents, trademarks and copyrights, industrial espionage, illegal labor practices, violations of war regulations, violations of trust, secret rebates and kickbacks commercial and political bribery, wash sales, misleading balance sheets, false claims, dilution of products, that's like cutting the mustard, prohibited <laughs> form of monopoly, income tax falsification, adulteration of foods and drugs, padding of expense counts, use in substandard materials, rigging markets, prefixing, mislabeling, false weights and measurements, internal corporate manipulation, etc. Sounds Do like politics to me. Can you believe they put it <laughs> seriously? Et cetera. I mean, that's but that's but this is this is what we're talking, white collared crimes. How are these corporations getting away with it? Back in those days, that's what they were doing. The victims of white collared crimes numbered in the millions, many whose lives were destroyed in stock market swindles and labor abuses. At the time of his 1931 pretrial proceedings, Capone gave an interview into Liberty Ma to Liberty Magazine in which down in Florida, the year I lived there, a shady newspaper publisher's friend was running a bank. He had unloaded a lot of worthless securities upon unsuspecting people. One day, his bank went fluey. Fluey. His bank went fluey. I guess that meant it went away. Fluey. Went goodbye. Fluey. I didn't even know that was a word. The crooked publisher and the banker were urging bankrupt it defunct. It went to funk. <laughs> depositors who were being paid 30 cents on the dollar to put their money in another friend's bank. Many did so. And just about 60 days later, that bank collapsed like a house of cards, too. Do you think those bankers went to jail? No, sir. They're among Florida's most re representative citizens. They're just as bad as the crooked politicians. I ought to know about them. I've been feeding them clothing long enough. I never knew until I got into this racket how many crooks there were dressed in expensive suits and talking with uh, affected accents. Another robber baron who may have fueled Capone's rationale was Boston-based banker political 
patriarch Joseph P. Kennedy. Oh, According yeah. to the news reports, Al Capone had known Kennedy since they cut a bootlegging arrangement in 1926. By the time Capone was imprisoned, Kennedy was widely known to have been one of the most offensive robber barons of the era. I mean, fueled by such rationalizations, Capone's heirs set about engineering their own vision of the American dream. Such an enterprise required distinct, uh, distinct divisions of labor and brain power. And in his pre-prison powwow, Capone installed an executive team with the requisite talents. Virgil Peterson, who headed the Chicago Crime Commission for three decades, later remembered that a friend of his was offered $25,000 a year to your job to direct a, quote, new corporation. Further investigation revealed that the corporation was, in fact, the Capone Syndicate. Peterson's friend passed on the offer, but the syndicate continued their, their headhunting, and Capone, Capone's eventual appointment of a CEO successor incorporated a decent character, uh, sorry, a, a a person characterized by a stealthy brilliance. In naming 42 years face. What's that? A clean face. Shh. Um, okay. They set. Deceit. What the hell? Are you serious? Deceit? Okay. Incorporated a deceit characterized by a stealthy brilliance. Here, in naming 42-year-old Frank Nitty, Ni Nitto, to the top post, Capone employed a strategy that has been largely ignored in discussions of Chicago crime. The boss is quite often a lightning rod, intentionally positioned to deflect attention from the real power. An example, the lower profile board of directors. Nitty's appointments were also predictably, predictable given his Sicilian birth and seniority over the other members of the outfit, as they now called themselves, most of whom were barely 30 when Capone was collared. So they were all kids. Yeah. They are all kids at that time. All the movies make them look to be older men. They're not. Yeah. It's like the what we were talking about the other day, the signing of the uh, Declaration of Independence. They were all Very young. True. Benjamin Benjamin Franklin was like 30 years old, but there were people that were signing it and they're, they're, they were teenagers. 18, 19, 21. They were as young as 12, some of them. Yeah. I mean, this was, they were, they were young. But then again, back then, people didn't live as long. Yeah. People matured a little bit. You were lucky. <laughs> yeah. Mm hmm. Um, all right, the quality of life wasn't that good either. <laughs> well, no, it wasn't. It was much different. All right, back to these young Turks. Nitty was never the Tommy gun wielding uh, enforcer that he's depicted. <sighs> He'd send people out to do it. <laughs> he earned his sub subrequet, the enforcer, his nickname, because of his role mandated enforcement of the internal rules adopted by the board of directors. This responsibility did not entail gunfire, only arbitration. Born Francesco Raffelli Nitto in Agoria, Agor, Agori, uh, Agor, Agori, 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 Sicily. I'm going to go with Agori. In 1889, Nitti was the fact smallish, introspective gangster, but like Capone's other successors, he appreciated the effect of the occasional show of power. Within two, within two months, I think of this was the beginning of what what we refer to as the syndicate. It was a syndicate, a syndication. They put everybody together in a syndication. They syndicated. Um, Nitty's installation as CEO. Bombs went off in forty warehouses and offices around in and around Chicago. No one was hurt and little actual stock was destroyed. The attacks were forceful announcements to the Chicago citizens that the outfit was now in charge. So they put on a damned fireworks show to let everybody know that the outfit was now in charge of Chicago. Isn't that something? 
Seriously, that's something. Within within two months, bombs went off in 40 warehouses. That's a bombing every other day. Virtually every mass media portrayal of Frank Nitti has bordered on the fala- has bordered on the fallacious. fallacious. Most recently, a 1987 film, The Untouchables. You've seen that. I've seen that. Nitty was depicted as the villainous arch enemy of the equally misrepresented heroic prohibition agent, Elliot Ness. Didn't, um, who played him? Kevin Costner, right? Red? Red. That was in the movie. That actually, it was Robert Stack that played him in the uh, series. The Untouchables. No, the 1987. Was Robert Stack. The the 87 film. It was Kevin Costner. Oh, that the played movie. Us. Yeah. Okay. Well, in the Nitty's... series, The Untouchables, it was Robert Stack. Okay. Now wait a second. We talked about this because I thought that. All right. Let, let, let's 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 read through this. In the film's dramatic climax, the intrepid Ness pushes Nitty off a rooftop. To his death. In fact, nothing like that ever occurred. Nitty's death had absolutely nothing to do with Ness, who ironically was a womanizing anti booze enforcer who ultimately drank himself to death. I thought he killed himself by shooting himself. Oh. No, that's Nitty. Nitty did that. Um, actually, Frank uh, Nitty. That's who we're talking about, Frank Nitty. No, but they said ultimately drank himself to, get, to death. They're talking about. Uh, uh, <laughs> you just said Nitty. his name. Nitty, listen. No. Nitty's death had absolutely nothing to do with Ness. Oh, Neth, who who was ironically a womanizer, anti-booze enforcer who yes. drank himself. Oh, Elliot Ness was the the A real hypocrite. A real hypocrite. Made himself out to be a hero. Gotcha. But Nitty shot himself. Correct? Yeah, right by I, I walked by the Got spot in, in Berwyn, Illinois. Okay. Wrong the Burlington track line. Peter Faulkner, thank you very much. Appreciate your um your uh, super sticker there, buddy. Uh at Michael Graham. Adam's too young to remember the Untouchable series from the 60s, right? Yeah, the Untouchable series from the 60s. I'm sorry. About- <laughs> Ness was the drunk. Thank you, Big Mo. Um, okay, let's get back to the article here. This is interesting as hell. Nitty's parents brought him to America when he was three years old, settling in Brooklyn, the New York borough that gave him rise to so many Chicago, Chicago bosses. It's not known if he associated with Capone, Torrio, uh, or Al Capone during this period, although it's highly likely given where he would soon uh, end up. After learning the barber trade, Nitty became a barber? He was a yeah. damn... No kidding. Okay, so he's... It's like Joe Collada. It's right. cutting hair. Barbershop. But, okay. So he he, he learned the barber Joe's trade. Joe's in here, too. Hi, Joe. How you doing? I, it's, no, I saw Joe was in here earlier. Um, maybe maybe we'll get another barbershop story from Joe today. Who knows? We'll see if he calls. Um, okay. So, let's see. Uh, during this time period, okay. So, uh, Nitty entered the New York to Chicago gangster pipeline around 1920. In the Windy City, Nitty quickly made his name as one of Chicago's premier fence operators with his extensive network of shady buyers for stolen goods. Nitty was perfectly positioned in 1920 to make the transition to bootlegging with Torrio's syndicate. Nitty made his bones with Torrio Capone as a successful smuggler of top shelf whiskey from Canada to Chicago and in 1930 was convicted of a lesser tax charges than his boss, Capone, who was jailed one year later. He worked Within- very closely with um, Kennedy, Joe Kennedy. With his loyal wife, Anna, spearheading his early parole petition, the prison received character references from, among others, a mortuary owner who was a longtime friend of the gangsters, one can only wonder how much business the syndicate had sent his way. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> My family undertakes. Sounds, like re- sounds like the Montclair uh, funeral home. <laughs> Ex- exactly. Um, that's that's unbelievable when you think about it. Yeah, I'm keeping you busy. You know, we're sending you some work. 
All right. I mean, you know, relax about this. Do us a favor. We'll send you more bodies. Unbelievable. <laughs> no, it's unbelievable when you think about it. I mean, it's okay. Um, Nitty himself promised the parole board that if paroled, he would immediately move to Kansas City and accept a position in the dairy business. He's going to go milk cows. Someone milk cows, Brad. <laughs> right. he, would do, he would, of course, do neither. Granted parole soon after the big guy went away. Nitty instead returned to Chicago and accepted a the leadership post bequeathed to him by Capone. With Nitty in place to draw the flak, the board of directors, the outfit, was free to forge the consummate gangster think tank, devising schemes that would that allowed their enterprise to flourish for decades. More important, their stewardship effectively granted their uh, descendants a seamless merge with the upper world, old mob tribe. Uh, sorry, the, old money the young tribe. Turks. The young Turks would come up. Beyond doubt, the most significant member of this board would be the 25-year-old referred to by his associates as Joe. Joe. Accardo has more brains for breakfast than Al Capone ever had all day. That's that's the quote by George Murray, the Chicago American columnist. And Antonio, they, used to, they used to call him Joe because his nickname was Joe Batters. Antonino Leo Leonardo Accardo was born in Chicago April 28, 1906, the son of a Sicilian immigrant shoemaker. The youngest of five siblings with three brothers and a sister, he grew into a five foot nine inch, 200 pound barrel of muscle. As a Jesus, man, that's that's big, actually. That's a tree Good trunk, goal. is what that is. That's a tree trunk. Uh, <laughs> as, as a teenager raised in Little Sicily on Chicago's northwest side, he got his parents' assent to join the workforce instead of enrolling in high school. Little is known about Ricardo's youth. Again, see these the big leader, no education. You don't need education. You need perseverance. You need uh, confidence, and you need you need drive. You need guts <laughs> and guts and guts. That's right. It takes guts. Sure does. Um, little is known about his youth. The young Antoni Antonino held various jobs, among them grocery clerk, delivery boy, and truck driver. Those were his day jobs. By night, the teenage Ricardo made a rapid ascent up the ladder of crime, starting as a pickpocket. I'll start as a magician. See that? Start as a damn magician. How do you steal somebody's watch? <laughs> I'm serious, man. Think about it. How do you how do you pick locks? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how to pick locks and steal watches. That's what I did. He came from humble, oh, humble keep going. means. He came from humble means. Okay. I used it to entertain. I thought it was funny. Okay. Graduating to house burglar and then car thief. Although he was hit with, a, with numerous arrests, the youngster never spent a night in jail. And as an adult, he never would. Years later, FBI agents would describe his language as laced with profanity while grudgingly admitting that he was never a braggart or a liar. After the excesses of his youth, Accardo would become renowned for his fairness. When Volstead passed, Accardo's parents, like many other Sicilian, their Sicilian neighbors, joined the cottage industry of alcohol home cooking. The cottage industry of alcohol home cooking. What the hell is that? It's not gin. You make your own, you have your own distilleries and all the, all the people in the neighborhood had their own distilleries, and then they would sell them to the syndicate, and the syndicate would put them in speakeasies, whatever, for consumption. Okay. Their son, among with his punk chums, I'm going to guess those are bust-out kids, right? Bust-outs? Punk chum? It. Gravitated to Claude Maddox Circus Cafe, located on North Avenue. Maddox was on the periphery of the Torio Bootlegging Syndicate, Tithing the requ the request percentage, the request request percentage from the gang from Cicero, young Tor Antoni Antonino's pals at the circus included Vincenzo Gibaldi, 
a.k.a. the infamous machine gun Jack McGurn, Capone's right. chief hitman, was such liaisons. Accardo was brought under the Torrio umbrella, where he functioned as an enforcer, compelling the syndicate's franchised bar owners and loan shark debtors to pay up. He wielded his baseball bat so forcefully at human heads, not baseballs, that he soon acquired the moniker Joe Batters. His closest friend addressed him as Joe so regularly that he was given diminutive, that he was given dim, diminutive, diminutive Tony, was all but forgotten even uh, years later by his own wife. Hmm. That given hey, Joe. Hey, Joe. <laughs> It was a common thing back in those days, even back in the 50s. Hey, Joe, if you didn't know a guy's name, it was hey, Joe. Diminutive. Diminutive. Sorry, guys. I got to look words up sometimes. That was given diminutive. He was given diminutive. Um, Tony was all but forgotten even years later by his own wife. Okay. At the height of his Chicago beer wars, the Capone, uh, with Capone forced to swell the ranks of his personal army, young Accardo first came to Capone's attention. According to some accounts, Joe was brought to Capone by one of the big guy's bosses, tough Tony Capizio. Still others believe McGurn suggested the young muscle. In any I believe event, it was Jack McGurn, because Jack, Jack McGurn was really close to Tony. In any event, the, the seminal first meeting between Capone and Joe, as deduced by the FBI, occurred in 1926, when the 20-year-old youngster was ushered into uh, one of Capone's headquarters, the Four Deuces, the Lexington, or the Metropole Hotel. His enlistment procedure was quite simple by Italian mob standards. There was no elaborate East Coast Mafia ritualism, melodrama, and symbolism. Most likely, there was a quick oath of loyalty to Capone and the syndicate with the young capo to be swearing to uphold the most intrinsic Sicilian beliefs, respect for wives and families, and contempt for stoolies. What are stoolies? <laughs> Snitches. Snitches. Rats. Stool, whatever stool you want to call them. Stool yeah. pigeons. Stoolies. A stoolie. I know who's a stoolie. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Accardo thus became a fixture in the lobby of Capone's headquarters, where the young tough often sat guarding the entrance, Chicago typewriter in his lap. Completely loyal to the syndicate, Joe made his bones with Capone Torrio by eliminating traitors to the regime. When the Northsiders convoy of assassins fired on Capone on April 26, 1926, it was Joe who pulled his boss down and shielded him with his 20-year-old body. Capone was rightfully impressed and elevated Accardo to the role of his personal driver and chief bodyguard. It would be seen that the role of driver for the boss often pres uh, presaged a future leadership post. Yeah, you become the driver to the boss, man. You're like his right-hand guy. You're throughout his... history, throughout history, even, even times that most of us lived through, um, it was the driver. Like Joe Ferriola was uh, Ayupa's driver. Uh, Sizulik. Capone wasn't Sicilian, though. He wasn't, right? Red, he was half Sicilian. Yes. Is that right? Yes. He was. He spoke Sicilian. Okay. Um, Accardo's star rose quickly, and it was widely assumed that he was a key player in the notorious St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929. Former Chicago FBI agent and Accardo biographer Bill Romer held that Accardo was actually one of the gunmen, along with John Scalise, Albert Anselmi, and Jack McGurn. Accardo was matched with, uh, also matched the description of the man using the names James Morton, who rented the getaway car, which had been disguised as a police car. Four months later, when two of the assassins and Selmy and Scalise were murdered in Indiana by Capone after plotting a mutiny. They were beaten to a pulp with a baseball bat. Jesus. Agent Romer is among those who believe Accardo wielded the stick. Man, so he was you know still. Why? 
You know why? Because Romer had illegal wiretaps. They weren't legal to take into court, but they were illegal wiretaps. And he would listen in on conversations. Subsequently, Capone was heard to say about Joe, quote, this guy is a real Joe Batters. So there's his nickname, Joe Batters. After the madness of that spring, Joe accompanied Capone as his personal bodyguard when the boss and a dozen other syndicate members attended the 1929 Atlantic City Mob Convention. During a break, Cardo went to the tattoo parlor and had a bird emblazoned on the back of his right hand. The creature appeared to flap its wings when Joe opened and closed his fist. What? Are you serious? He had a bird that flapped its wings that... Up on the back of his hand? Yeah. Oh, man, I want to see that. <laughs> that sounds cool. Uh, unimpressed, Capone chastised his young soldier, quote, kid, that will cost you as much money and trouble as it would to wear a badge with the word thief on it. Right. Oh, despite the thoughtless act, Joe remained close with the big guy. Later that year, Joe was arrested for vagrancy in Florida while golfing with Capone and Jack McGurn. When Capone's, what's, what's vagrancy? Uh, vag just hanging out, uh, no place to go. Vagrancy. A right, vagrant living on the street, being a bum? Yeah. It's a catch-all charge. The stay yeah, living like a homeless guy. Oh, he was arrested for vagrancy Probably while he was golfing? Name, I, you know, but what's your name? If he had enough money to go golfing, he's got enough money to stay somewhere, doesn't he? They wanted to pick him up and fingerprint him. <laughs> Holy cripes. When Capone's arch enemy, temporary president of the Union, Sicil Sicil Joe Alio, Siciliano, Siciliano, Union Siciliana, Joe Alio was murdered on October 3rd. In October of 1930, Joe was considered the prime suspect. In 1934, three years after the outfit assumed control, 28-year-old Joe Accardo wed Clarice Potter, sorry, Porter, 22, a beautiful blonde chorus girl and the daughter of Polish immigrants. So he went for the Polish girls. <laughs> the Polish girls, man, they got it going on. Blondes, <laughs> No, man, I'm telling you, I worked in the strip clubs. Those girls from Poland? Yeah. So <laughs> as as best as a, things don't change. <laughs> as best as could be ascertained, Joe was a faithful husband, as well as a doting father of two sons and two daughters. In a short time, Accardo became capo, a young boss with his own crew of 10. Among his chief responsibilities was overseeing the outfit's gambling operations. Attempting to put a veneer on his image, Joe insisted that his associates refer to him as JB, a moniker more befitting to the country club set. But try as he might, the name Joe stuck. Years earlier, as a teenaged runner for the Torio, Torio Capone organization, Joe had often worked side by side with a young man, nine years his senior, named Felice De Lucia, better known as Paul Rica. They became each other's lifelong best friends. The fellowship would span decades. Their shared stewardship of the Capone regime's residue would, would become the stuff of local legend. This is, so this is how it, 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 see, this makes more damn sense now to me that the bosses, how could there be so many bosses? You know, who was the boss? Well, it was Tony Accardo, it was Paul Rick, you know, it was Jack Cerrone, and it was a blah, 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 blah. No, it's like they all came up together and were equals as kids. And therefore, as they became bosses, they shared it. It was this one went to jail. They so were the young guy, Turks, the original young Turks. It makes more sense. It's starting to make sense to me. I hope it is to you guys, too. I hope that you're enjoying today's show because um, this is a damn eye opener. Um, so there's a GoFundMe to buy Adam a vintage Mattel speak and spell. Is there really? They want to put a speaking spell together so that I can. Is is this this is the crowd making jokes about me not having to look up words every once in a while? Sorry, I got to look up words every once in a while. Well, you Sloppy mispronounced girl. something too. Like I, I don't take the uh, offense by it, but you said um, Joey Aiello was his name. Aiello, yes. Did I say that wrong? Yeah. Aiello, Aiello, yes. Mm. 
Vagrant. Yeah, the crowd. That's what I was saying. Okay, so Paul Rica. I think we can get through Paul. Let's let's do this. Felice de Lucia <laughs> was born in 1897 in Naples, Italy, making him four, 34 years old when Al Capone was convicted of tax evasion. In Italy, Felice commented that uh, his first hey, murder... Excuse he, me a second, Adam. Committed. Um, Capone was half Neapolitan. Oh, he was? Yes. Um, Sicilian and Neapolitan. My bookie's daughter, thanks for joining the channel. Uh, we're doing anything next week because it's Frank's birthday. Uh, yeah, his birthday's on the 14th, I believe, which is next Wednesday. Yeah, we'll do something special. Sure thing. Thanks for reminding us. Um, I was thinking about that earlier. I always go, I always say to Red, well, what's the anniversary of what happened on this day? You know, because every every week it's something different. So thanks it was for Pearl Harbor Day. <laughs> Yeah, today was Pearl Harbor Day. Hit the like button, guys, if you're just coming in. Uh, Devin Burrell, it's good to see you. Hey, Devin, I didn't know you were in um, um, VR. Dude, if you ever want to play uh, Pavlov or something, let me know. I saw that you're on Steam. Okay, so, um, or somewhere in, in meta. So, all right. Red has no idea what I'm talking about, and neither does I probably. Do. I, I, I listen to audience. you all the time while you're, I'm going to play. <laughs> Shoot zombies, VR. man. Gonna... VR, <laughs> VR. <laughs> okay. So um, in, in Italy, Felice, we're talking about Paul uh, Rica. Uh, Felice committed his first murder at age 18 when his sister, Amelia, was disgraced by the family of a boy she was dating. In a fit of rage, Felice murdered the suitor, Emilio Peri Perillo. Perillo. After serving two years, Felice tracked down and murdered the witness. Uh, murdered the witness who had fingered him um, on the run. Delucia stole the identity of a fellow Neapolitan, Paul Maglio, and made his way to New York and the New York uh, from New York to Chicago gangster pipeline in the Windy City. Delucia assumed the name Paul Rica and took took to work as a waiter, a job that would earn him um, Paul the waiter, the Rica. And we have right now on the phone, Joe Collada. How you doing today, Joe? Good, Adam. Uh, someone, Sluck or something is their name, made a comment about George Mustardini. I seen it on there. Okay. And Tony Cardo was built like him. George Mustardini was a boxer. He was from our neighborhood <laughs> around Bell Park. Okay. And uh, Joe Lombardo was like promoting him. He was one of the promoters. So he comes in to Igor. Yeah, you know, I used to. So he comes in one day with tickets, and he says, "Joe, take ten tickets for this fight." I go, "Joe, it's hard to sell." He says, "Sell these tickets." I said, "Joe, it's hard. I, I'll take one ticket. I'll go." He's take all ten. They're easy to sell. He goes, "I sell a hundred at a time." I go, "Yeah, I know that's because you're Joe Lombardo." I says, "But I'm a barber." I says. You give me 10 tickets, i got to sell them one at a time. It's hard to sell. He goes, let me show you how to sell those tickets one at a time. I go, okay, Joe. So Igor, the guy I worked for, his nephew comes in. We called him PJ. His name was uh, Adamowski. was his last name. So he comes walking, and he don't know who Joe Lombardo is. So he says to Joe, uh, he says, hi, Uncle Lou. That's Igor. Joe says, here, I'd like you to buy a ticket to go see George Mustardini fight. He goes, I'm not interested in fighting. He goes, no, I think you should buy a ticket to go to the fight. Now I'm standing behind Joe and I got a smile on my face because I'm like laughing because I could see how hard it is. For this guy don't know Joe, so he's not going to buy the ticket. He says, I don't want the ticket. Joe says, buy the ticket. So Igor goes, I'll take the ticket. I'll take the ticket. Joe goes, no, he'll buy the ticket. The kid goes, I told you I'm not interested. So Joe tells the kid, did you ever hear the wind man? And the kid goes, no, who's the wind man? He goes, he travels up and down the street. And he looks in the windows. And if he sees a boxing ticket, he keeps going. If he don't see a boxing ticket, he comes in and messes up the whole house. Now buy the boxing ticket. The kid says, I'm not buying the boxing ticket. Igor says, I'll take the ticket. I'll take one. <laughs> so 
<laughs> I love it. That's awesome. It's, it's funny when someone don't know who you are, they're not intimidated. You know what I mean? Yeah. That was cute. But George Mustardini ended up, he was, I think they called him, I don't know, the Italian assassin or something. Still I remember. I, I used to go see him at the Aragon Ballroom with Joe. Assassin or something. But he was a boxer from our neighborhood. Yeah. He was really good. But anyhow, it's just a barbershop story. That's awesome. Thanks. Thanks for calling in and telling us that one. Um, I, I appreciate that, Joe. How how was your um how are your holidays going? How was Thanksgiving? Good, real good. Everything's going good, guys. You get you got all your Christmas shopping ready? All done? I only buy one gift, my wife. She buys all the rest. There you go. She buys like <laughs> ten gifts for each grandkid. I got five grandsons. There you go. Awesome. Yeah. Gonna be should be it should be a good good uh good Christmas this year. Yeah, she cooks like crazy, so it'll oh. be good. Oh, it'll I've be- I've I've had Pam's cooking. That's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. It'll be twice what you've seen when you were here. I want to come in for Christmas. I really You're do. You're welcome. You guys are more to- <laughs> Thanks so much, Joe. Well, we'll we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, sorry to interrupt your show. No, man, you're not an interruption. I love it when you call in. When I seen Mustardini's name and Sluck, whoever that Sluck is, yeah. they must be from our neighborhood that they knew about George Mustardini. Have but to be. Okay. But not many people knew about him. He was How supposed to be the Great White Hope. <laughs> the Great White Hope. Didn't they make yeah, a movie they, about him? No, they thought he was going to be the Great White Hope. But I tell you, he got in the ring one time. And uh, they had to fight at the Hyatt House. So that we're all around the ring watching the ring, the fight. And the bell rings, and it looked like this guy came out of the kitchen to box him. And, and the guy started to come toward George, and George cocked his arm, and the guy fell down. He didn't even hit him. Oh, and he fell down. And George looked at his hand like, what the f- <laughs> <laughs> But he was one of Joe's boxers. I don't know if you remember him, Red. I he do. Was, I yeah. do. He he fell and down like I he fell down like that Sonny Liston. That Sonny yeah. Liston at dropped down. Fighting, that fight at that time, they were fighting at the Aragon Ballroom. A- Aragon Ballroom was that right, Joe? No, that, no, that was at the uh, Hyatt House in Rosemont. Hyatt House in Rosemont. Okay. Yeah, they had a boxing match there that night. Wow. But anyhow, I'll let you guys go. Hey, back to work. thanks, Joe. Good to good to talk to you. We'll talk to you okay. soon. Okay, Merry Christmas, everybody. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. I love it when Joe Collada calls in, man. It's just because so many people, so many people are, you know, I hate six because next next week is Frank's birthday, Frank Collada's birthday. And when Frank passed away and I I decided to keep the channel going and said, let's continue on about the mob history and Chicago specifically, let's keep doing this. Uh, Some people were, um, you know, opposed to it, but. Uh, you know, Frank's family's appreciative of this, what we're still doing. I mean, it. the longer you talk about somebody, they they just, they stay alive. It's, you know, they're not forgotten. So, I And the young saying. man that he mentioned, who wasn't that young anymore, was Joey Lombardo. And Joey Lombardo was considered a young Turk. He was on his I- way up. Well, look, um, let's finish. You know, we're going to keep this article open, Red. Let's, let's, let's do part two next week. It'll be something to do. We can talk more about this because this is fascinating as hell to me. And we'll pick up where we left off on Paul, the, the waiter, Rika. And uh, how's that sound to you, Red? Sounds okay to me. Sounds like a plan, guys. If you haven't been out here to Vegas and you plan to come to Vegas, don't forget to do the Vegas Mob Tour. You guys can use a promo code, excuse me, promo code Mob Vlog, and that'll get you a 20% discount, which is a, a damn good discount. So... Uh, use that promo code. Come out and uh, do the tour with us. We'd love to uh, love it's to have you. It's a great guys. tour. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Join us for the Vegas Mob Tour. Experience Sin City's dark past. Learn how Bugsy Siegel built the flamingo. Find out who killed him and why. Hear who Jimmy Hoffa supplied money to back in the 50s. Visit the actual home used in the 1995 blockbuster movie, Casino. And 
other filming locations as well. See the real jewelry store where Frank Collada and his crew were busted. Sit in the exact spot where Frank Lefty Rosenthal's car was bombed back in 82. View never before seen footage of Frank Collada telling personal stories about Tony Spilatro, Joey the Clown Lombardo, and the Hole in the Wall Gang. This is how serious we thought he's on. It's almost like a peach color. It was brown then. The only thing changed is the driveway. Here's an offer you can't refuse. Upgrade to the Untouchables experience. Following the tour, you'll enjoy a three-course dinner at the Tuscany Gardens, and then VIP seating for the long-running hit The Rat Pack is Back show. Experience Vegas the way it was meant to be. All right, Red. Well, it has been a great afternoon, and uh, thanks again for coming on the show, guys. We're gonna we're gonna read a little bit about Red's uh, Red's life here, and uh, nobody cares and what oh, I did about my channel. channel. Okay. So yeah, we're gonna jump over there in about ten minutes. Uh, you guys, it has been awesome. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for coming here today. Again, you guys are the reason that uh, you guys are the reason that uh, the show exists. Don Berlin, Young Turks are a member of a revolutionary party of the Ottoman Empire who carried out the revolution of 1908 and deposed the Sultan Abdul Hamid II. Does that have anything to do with the Young Turks, though, that we're Don Berlin, a young it was their attitude. For radical change to established order. The Young Turks of the faculty demolished the idea of the self. They're the up and comers. Yeah. I guess at one time we were all young Turks. Yeah. Well, I mean, ambitious. Of different things, ambitious. You know, of different things. You know, Red, when I was younger, I was a seaman. Of course, at one point we were all seamen. <laughs> all right, Red. I'll talk to you later, man. I'll see you soon. You guys have a great day. It's been fun. Mob vlog.